Father, we thank you. Then in the midst of our waiting, we can still give you a praise. In the midst of our trusting, we can still say hallelujah to your name. And Father, you are worthy whether you do it now, whether you do it next week, whether you do it next year, you are still worthy of all praise and worthy of all honor. So Father, we honor your name right now that we're not just waiting, but you are with us in the midst of the waiting. That we can give you glory, God, not just because of what you're going to do, but because of what you've already done. You've already made ways. You, you've already opened doors. You've already delivered us. You've already forgiven us. So Father, we sit in a posture of praising your name. Every time we think about you, we have to thank you. Every time we think about it, we have to praise your name because you are worthy, 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 worthy. We honor you, Lord, in this place. We give you glory right now because you're great and mighty in every way. Thank you, Lord, that you woke us up this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we pressed our way through and we are here today to give you glory. We are here today because if it had not been for the Lord on our side, would have given up a long time ago. But thank you, God, that grace and mercy has followed us thus far. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Lord, even as now as we open your word today, may your word speak to our hearts and minds afresh and remind us and show us all that you've called us to be. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we say this prayer and all of God's people said amen. Come on and give God glory in this place. Come on and give him glory. Come on and give him glory. While you're celebrating the Lord, would you help us thank the Lord for this music ministry on this morning as they have ushered us into the presence of the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. We thank God. We praise the Lord today. What a joy. It is so good to see you on this morning. And uh, it's a joy to see you. We thank God for each and every one of you, both our family that's in the room and our family that's watching online. We are grateful, grateful, grateful for your presence here on this morning. And we are overjoyed that we get to worship the Lord together. The thing about the Christian life is that it's not just a solo sport where you just do your own thing. It's a community. It's a family of faith. The Bible says this way, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. Something happens when we gather together. Something happens when you lift your voice and somebody else lifts their voice and we can praise the Lord together. It don't even matter what key we're in. Just open your mouth and just give him glory and let the Lord, the Lord can interpret it all. Amen. Something happens when we come together and we worship the Lord together. There's power in worship. We are so thankful for you. We've been in a series through the book of James and uh, we are nearing the end of that. A few more sermons left in that book. But if you have your Bibles, open to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I want to look at the latter part of, uh, of that particular um, uh, chapter today. Uh, James chapter 4. We want to look at the latter part of that chapter. Uh, James 4. We're going to look at the starting verse 13 through the conclusion of the chapter. We're going to look at that together on today. Uh, James 4 verse 13. Reach this way. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend the year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Amen. You may take your seat. As you take your seat, will you just tell your neighbor next to you good morning, tell him I'm glad you came. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Let's turn the house lights up so they can see their Bible as they walk with me through this text today. Amen. Thank you so much. 
All right. I want you to see that Bible. I don't want you to think I'm making up anything. I want you to see right out the text where we're coming from. I want to share for a few moments today, family, from the subject of the danger of arrogance. The danger of arrogance. Uh, the Titan, the Titanic, was the largest, most luxurious ship afloat. No expense was spared in its construction. She boasted of these opulent staterooms, luxurious dining rooms, subtleless smoking rooms, ornate ceilings. The decor and the investment was something they had never seen. Libraries on this ship, swimming pool, elevators, a gymnasium, a Turkish bath, a squash court. They even had an eight-piece orchestra on this ship. Everything they could ever desire for the 325 first-class passengers along with everyone else. At the time, it was the leading edge of technology. It was to inspire, uh, insp inspire all. And many of us builders said it's, it's an unshakable ship. <laughs> the captain of the Titanic inf infamously said these words, I cannot imagine any condition with which this ship could ever go down. Matter of fact, there was a young shipmate that was working on the ship, and he replied these words, God himself cannot sink this ship. And yet, a few days later, on the first voyage of the Titanic, it would not be long before that ship would strike an iceberg and 1,500 lives would be lost. It was written by James Cameron in his book on the Titanic, said these words, the ship was not destroyed by the iceberg alone, but it was destroyed by a state of mind. It was this ideal of arrogance that really brought down the ship. It wasn't the fact that it hit an, hit an iceberg there in the dark, but it was an attitude and a state of mind that this ship is better than anything we've ever seen and no one can do anything about it. Friends, there is something about pride and arrogance that can get the best of any of us. There is something about pride and arrogance and overconfidence that can cause us to think more of ourselves than we really should. Perhaps that's why James in his letter, he's talked about so many different topics from chapter 1 to now chapter 4, but somewhere along the line, really in chapter 4, leading all the way in to the opening part of chapter 5, he picks up this theme of arrogance of, or overconfidence. And he really comes to warn you and I to make sure that to warn us about the danger of it in our lives and how you and I can overcome it. Here is the really here's the reality of it that, that this struggle with pride is something all of us face. If you're in this room today and say, you know, Pastor, I really don't struggle with pride, ah, uh, that was a prideful statement you just made. You just showed yourself just then. The reality is that all of us can have challenges and obstacles with this very issue and temptation. And what I want to do today, based on the truth of God's word, is give us a warning, but also give us a game plan for how we can overcome it in our lives. Here's the first thing we find in the text. We live in a world always making plans. <laughs> we live in a world that is always making plans. Listen to verse 13. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that place and spend the year there and carry on business and make money. He's saying, I want to, he, he, he's actually talking to the, to the business people and the entrepreneurs in the crowd when he writes the letter. He says, listen here, business people, and listen here, entrepreneurs and all those that work. He says, I know what it's like to have plans for your business. He says, I know what it's like for you to think about how you're going to make this and how you want to scale and how you want to grow and how you want to add more staff and how you want to sell more product. I, I, he said, I know all about your, your social media strategy and how to get your funnel together and trying to increase your cash flow. He says, I know all about your plans for next year and your plans about year three and year five. He says, listen, I know you got all kinds of plans. You got a business plan and a marketing plan. You got your own personal personal financial plan. He said, I know you're checking out your KPIs. You're looking at your forecast. You, you're trying to make sure your dollars are on track. I know you're looking at everything. He says, here's the reality. They lived in a day of progress and productivity. It's kind of day they lived in. They lived in a day where people where a lot of small business owners existed. 
where people were entrepreneurs. There were people that were silversmiths and goldsmiths and people that were accountants and bankers and they were people in this very community that were farmers and shoemakers and some were even tent makers like Paul that Make, that made their craft through working with leather. There were all kinds of people with all kinds of jobs. And sometimes they would travel to try to expand their business. One of the regions of that part of the world was a place called Decapolis, which was a collection of 10 cities where you could go from one city to the next city, but they were all about, at the bottom line, it's about how to make profit. Now I want you to catch this, that not only did they live in a time of productivity and progress, but we too live in a time of productivity and progress. I mean, just a few months ago, we had a prayer for small business owners and entrepreneurs, and over half the church came to the altar as we prayed over your business. I mean, it's a day and age where one study suggested that prior to COVID, uh, black women were the leading group of entrepreneurs, but now post-COVID, they are the leading group, some 20% more growth than anyone else among black women entrepreneurs. That, that, that many people understand what it's like to plan and to be progressive. That, that, that many of you in this room, you got your own plans for your own life. Things that you want to do, things that you want to accomplish. We even live in a world now that in the workforce that many companies are talking about AI or artificial intelligence because they're trying to figure out how do they increase their efficiencies. And for some of us, we're trying to navigate what does this new world, how does it impact my career, even my future? This is because we live in a world of progress and productivity. And after all, you got your own plans. You got plans that you want to do in your life. You got goals and ambitions you want to do. Perhaps you're retired, or perhaps you are pre preparing to retire one day. You got your own plans. You got plans about a house you want to buy, or plans about a car you want to buy. You got plans for your kids to graduate. You got plans for your kids to get off the payroll. You got all kinds of plans in your life. That's a long-term plan. Just keep praying. That's what they tell me. You got all kinds of plans and goals in your life. And I don't want you to think that, that, that he is saying something that's wrong with planning. He's not looking down on planning. But he's saying to us, he lived in a world where everyone was making plans. And we too live in the same world where we know what it's like to make plans and to think about the future and to dream about the future and to plan for the future. As a matter of fact, our church on next June 2025, our church will turn 50 years old. We'll be at 50 years old next June. And as we approach 50 years, We've started a strategic planning process. We've engaged with a consultant that's walking us through a strategic planning process so we can begin to shape a strategic plan that guide us as a church for the next three to five years. Our hope is to finish that sometime this summer and then begin to share that with leaders this fall and with our church family next spring in January. Uh, 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 next, matter of fact, next month we're going to be surveying you. Later on, yeah, next month we're going to be surveying you to get your input on this, on this plan as we begin to shape what we're asking God for as a church for the next three to five years. Because we believe this, friends, planning is important. There's nothing wrong with having a plan and asking God and seeking and thinking about where you want to go and how you want to get there. Matter of fact, sometimes somebody said it without not, not failing to plan, it's planning to fail. But I want to catch this. Not only did they live in a time where they were all these plans, but here's the second thing I want you to catch out the text. Planning is a good thing, but don't leave God out your plans. <laughs> he, he's not looking down on planning. He, he's saying, listen, you need a plan. You need to be thinking about the future, dreaming about the future, thinking about what God is going to do. But then he gets to verse 14 and says this, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mess that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. He says, listen, there's nothing wrong with having plans. And I know you're thinking about which way you're going to do and how you're going to do it, how long you're going to be there and what's going to happen next. He said, I know you got all your analytics. I know you've looked at all your data. I know you got all your information to make your predictions. He says, but listen, let me give you a couple of things. He says, number one, he says, recognize your own humanity. He says, I don't want you to, he said, I don't care how successful you are. I don't care how much progress you've made. He said, I want you to understand you don't know tomorrow. 
He says, you can make all the plans you want. You can dream all you want. You can plan all you want. He says, the good thing. He says, but also understand your own limitations, that you are only human and there's only so much you can do because you don't know tomorrow. Tomorrow, a virus could come and shut down the whole world. Tomorrow, you could get sick and your whole world changes. Tomorrow, you could get in a car accident and that would change. Tomorrow, you could have a mental health breakdown. Tomorrow, a legal situation could show up in your life and turn your world upside down. But also tomorrow, you could win the lot lottery. Never mind, we don't, we don't gamble, so I'll take that out. Take that out. Let me, let me change that. Tomorrow, you could get a significant bonus on your job. Tomorrow, you can get a promotion. Tomorrow, you can sign a massive contract which would change your business for the rest of your life. Tomorrow, you can land your dream job. Tomorrow, you can have access to the capital you need for your business. Tomorrow, you can meet the man or the woman of your dreams. Tomorrow, they can, you, can, you can say the report of the disease in your body or someone else they can't find anymore. Friends, we don't know what tomorrow brings. So as a consequence, we got to plan, but we also got to learn how to hold our plans loosely because we simply don't know what tomorrow brings. We live in a world that's all about being responsible and being independent and saying, I made it and look at what I did. It starts with little kids. They do stuff and say, Daddy, look at me, Mama, look at what I did. And yes, it's important to be independent, but also understand this, it's even more important important to be dependent on a God who knows tomorrow when you don't know tomorrow. I remember my daughter one time was on the phone and I overheard a conversation between her and one of her friends and she must have been in elementary school because she was just talking about all the stuff they were going to do. And she says, yes, it's going to be all four of us. We're going to get together and we're going to go here and then we're going to go there and then we're going to come back and then you're going to spend the night and we're just going to have a great plan. I overheard her talking about all these plans and said to myself, listen, little girl, well, who, who's going to do all this? You are daddy. You mean I'm going to pick up, go to all these houses, pick up all these little girls, go all, of course I did it because you know that's just how you do sometimes. But, but anyway, the point is that sometimes you and I do the same thing to God, that we have God, we talking all these plans and talking all this stuff about what we go do and how we go do it and when we go do it. And sometimes we make the mistake not to ask God about the plans that we have in store. And God is saying, wait, how are you going to do all that? You, you got to make sure that you don't leave God out of your plans. He says it this way. He says, listen, not only do you not know tomorrow, he says, but your life is a vapor. He says, your life is, is a vapor. Your life, your life is, 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 is a vapor. It means puff of smoke. He says, your life, life, it's, it's here today, gone tomorrow. He says, your life, your life, your life is short. Your life is fragile. Your life is transient. It's, it's here today. It's, it's short. So he's trying to tell us, friends, because life is short, to be careful about trying to leave God out because we need God because life is so short. Psalm, Psalm 90 and 10 says, our days may come to 70 or 80, if our strength endures, he goes on to say, they, they pass quickly and we fly away. <laughs> Life is short, isn't it? This is May. Like, I don't even realize, like, what happened to February and March? <laughs> life, 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 life is so short. Life is so short. We, we've got two kids in college, and this past week we went to our daughter uh, got accepted into our, a, uh, a program called the Women in Excellence Program, and we went to the, the graduation this past uh, Tuesday. Um, and it was so cool. She had gone through this nine-week program and was real honored she got in, involved, and me and my wife are sitting there watching her. She gets this award, and uh, man, it's like, uh, like, when did that happen? Like, when did you become 21, 22? Like, when did that like, I'm still seeing, I'm still buckling somebody in their childcare seat. Like, I, 
Like life is so short. It passes so fast. Like I, I'm, I'm still in my 40s right now. Um, um, I'm in my 40s. I'm in my 40s, and uh, I'll leave my 40s later on this year. But while I'm still in my 40s, uh, it, it still doesn't feel like that. It feels like just yesterday, you know, we, we were just in our 20s moving to Dallas. It feels like just yesterday we're still teaching school. It feels like just yesterday was just trying to figure life out. Life is so short, isn't it? I mean, sometimes you look around your own life and you don't even, you know, even in your, think about your life and how short life is and where you are in this season and what the Lord, which the Lord has seen you through. And, and sometimes you just, you, you, when you take inventory, you realize how short life is. It feels like you were just the other day, just in high school, just, you know, you, it feels like just the other day you were just in your first apartment. It feels like just the other day you, you were just in your first job. It feels like just the other day your mom and dad and grandma were still around and still in the room and you could still call them up on the phone. It feels like just the other day that that was your reality. And, that, and some of us, we thought life would be like that all the time. I remember calling my grandmother and being able to go visit her and be able to spend time with her. And now things are so different in these different seasons. But life is so short. And James is saying to us in this past, he's saying, friends, have plans. But he's saying, friends, hold, hold your plans loosely because we don't. Life is a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. But look at what he says in verse 15. He says, he says, he says, friend, here's instead what you ought to say. If it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. He says, there's a better way. He says, here's the way to do it. Include God in your plans. That's what he's saying. He's saying here, he says, let me tell you how to do it in verse 15. He says, here's what I want you to do. He says, here's the best way to live your life. Here's the best way to live out your future. Here's the best way to lead your business. Here's the best way to do life in ministry. He says, here it is. Include God in your plans. He says, if it is the Lord's will, the old folks say, if the, if, 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 what they say, if, if the creek don't rise, if, 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 if the Lord say the same, that's what it is. Thank you so much. I'll try to get, if the Lord say the same, and if the creek don't rise, and they had some other stuff go with it, it but, they, but the point was, if it is the Lord's will, I'll be there. If it's the Lord's will, I'll show. I'm going to do my best, but I'm leaving my plans in the hands of God. Why is that? Because when you include God in your plans, you are recognizing God's sovereignty. So here's the reality. God is omnipotent, we are not. God is omnipresent, we are not. God is omniscient, we are not. God is omnibenevolent, God is opposite what we are. We can't be everywhere at the same time. We don't have all power, we don't know all things. So pride makes us think more of ourselves than we ought. But when you include God in your plan, what you are doing is saying, God, here's my plan, but God, I'm trusting you with the results. I'm trusting you with the plan, because I know if you don't move, Move, nothing's going to happen. This is what he's saying. Friend, this is the same thing that happens in the book of Job. Book of Job is about Job going through a season of suffering in his life. And in the midst of his suffering, his suffering doesn't match his plan for his life. It doesn't match what his friends thought would happen for his life. And so Job is wrestling. His friends are wrestling. And then in Job chapter 38, God says this, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Who marked off its dimensions? On which footing set it? Where were you when the morning stars sing together and the angels shouted for joy? In other words, he's saying, Job, you're not on my level, Job. You, you, you can't speak with me, Job. Job, rest in my plan. Don't just fight my plan. Let me give you another verse, friends. Proverbs 16, 9 says this, in, our, in, our, in their hearts, human, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. You hear me, friends? I want to catch this. Look at Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. 
include God in your plans. I know you want to grow your business, but ask God to guide your steps. I know you want to retire, but ask God to order your steps. I know you want to be in business, and I know you want to run for office. I know you want to volunteer, but ask God to order your steps. I know you want to buy property, but ask God to order your steps. I know you like him or like her, but ask God to order your steps and guide that relationship and make sure God cosigns on what God is telling you to do. in your Not just cosign, let God be the author. Ask God first. Say, God, what do you want me to do? Give me the strategy, give me the plan, give me the insight, give me the timeline. I think there are, let me give you three, three implications that come out of this verse. Here it is. Only what you do for Christ will last. Friends, I want to call you to a higher level of your planning because some of you are, are experts at planning at one level, but I want to ask you, are you planning anything you want to do for Christ? I know, I know you're thinking about all the different places you want to plan, but I want to ask you, friends, are you planning anything that you want to do for Christ? Have you, have you thought about how in your life can you help make disciples? How in your life can you join our mission to help growing people? Whether, whether you start a small group and we can help you do that. Uh, uh, how, are you, how are you giving? Are you giving regularly to the work of Concord Church so that we can do the impact and serve others in the way that God has called us to? Are you, are you praying about God giving you kingdom vision and, and a cause greater than yourself? The reason that you ought to think about this level of planning is because when you do God's work, it'll outlast you. Because when you do God's work, it not only stores treasure here, but it stores up treasure in heaven because because only what you do for Christ will really last. Here's another one, friends, another thought to consider. Don't take anything for granted. Did you hear me, friends? Don't take your health for granted. You only get one body. But take your medicine, see your doctor, go through all the tests, even though you don't want to go through the tests. Do your best to try to take care of what you have because life is but a vapor. Don't, don't take your family and friends for granted. That's all you got. So make sure that we don't sacrifice for the people we'll never see again what we need to give to the people that love us the most. It's so easy to give our lives hustling for the next dollar and hustling for whatever we think and miss out on what matters most in life. Don't take family and friends for granted. But also don't take your career for granted. You better know you may, you, you, you may not you may not always have the same income. You may not always have the same access. You may not always have the same position. So whatever God puts in your hands, make sure you manage that and handle it well as a gift while God has given it to you. Because somebody in the room can testify, seasons change. <laughs> I'm trying to tell somebody in the room, seasons change. And you got to make the most of what God gives you while you get a chance because when it's gone, it may never happen again. And you don't want to live with regrets. You want to live with gratitude that God, thank you for that season. I'm in a different season and I praise your name for each season you've allowed me to have in my life. Here, here's, here's another one, friends. You only get one life, so live it. I can tell you stories of people that kept putting off and postponing things, kept waiting for another day and waiting for another opportunity when, 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 when that, never, that opportunity never showed up. And, and there's some things, friends, that you just, you just need to live sometimes. Now, some of y'all need to tell y'all this because y'all already doing this, so I'm not talking to y'all. <laughs> but, but I'm talking to somebody in the room that, that, that for whatever reason, maybe for whatever the reason you you are, not, you are not just trusting God for what he's doing in your life right now. You, you, are, you are delaying so many plans and delaying so many things. I'm, I'm not saying you just spend everything now. What I am saying is this, that you do need to find a way to be able to enjoy and to be able to embrace what God is doing in your life right now. You may not see 80 years old. You may not see 70. So why not embrace what God is doing at 50 and live the way God has told you to live? 
Why not be the blessing to the church or be the blessing to the world? Why not enjoy? Why not trust God for today? Because listen, sometimes you can wait so long that you will miss out on what God wants to do in your today. There is work he wants you to do today. There is experience he wants you to do today. You might as well live while God has given it to you as a gift. Go ahead and live and enjoy what God has put in your hands and what God has put in your life. You only get one life. You only get one season. You only get one situation. So enjoy what God has given you. I've, I've, I've stood here too many times at funerals for a young man last year, 30 years old, and a young man, another last year, 52 years old. And I've seen too many individuals. I'm not saying they didn't live their life, but I am saying this. Life can be short, so when God calls you and God moves you and God leads you, go ahead and answer his call and say, I just want to do what God has called me to do in the season that he's given me. Come on, my single singles, don't you wait for God to send you somebody for you to start enjoying your life. You're going to live while God has given you what he's given you. You're going to live. You're going to move forward in your goal. You're going to do what God has told you to do. Live your life. Don't kill yourself for the temporary and you miss out on the eternal. What profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? What? Make God in your plans. Put him on your list. Put him on your schedule. Put him in your work. Don't be big in the world, but little in the kingdom. No, God has called you to too much. You cannot be your greatest cause. And then he closes this way. He says, listen, he says, stop all the boasting in verse 16. He says, as it is, you boast with your arrogant schemes. And all such boasting is easy. He just says, stop boasting. He says, stop, stop bragging. Stop, stop talking about yourself so much. He says, he says, I mean, he hard on us today, isn't he? He said, he says, stop all. He said, he says, stop, stop talking about, stop, stop boasting. Uh, Proverbs 27 and 1 says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. He's he just trying to encourage us, y'all, to keep God in your plans. He's trying to encourage us that when God gives you any level of success, don't you try to leave God out the success. Over in Deuteronomy, when the people of Israel are getting ready to move to the new land, he says, when you get over there in houses you didn't build, and wells you didn't dig, and vineyards you didn't plant, he says, don't you forget the Lord. And I came by to tell somebody today in the midst of all your planning, in the midst of all you're trying to accomplish and do, in the midst of all God's blessings on your life, don't you forget the Lord. <laughs> and don't you boast about it thinking that it's all about you and thinking it's all, <laughs> that you did it all on your own. Because the truth of the matter is that instead of boasting, what you need to start doing is start talking about how blessed God has allowed you to become. You need to let go of bragging and boasting and stand on the blessings of what God has done in your life. If I was honest, the truth be told, many of the things God has done in your life are not because of you. They are despite you. Hello, somebody. It ain't that you made all the right decisions and made all the right calls and made all the right moves and was at the right place at the right time every time and, and that the market always benefited you. No, it, it wasn't that you all made all the right decisions. No, it was despite your bad decisions, despite your mistakes, despite some of your shortcomings, despite some of your failures, despite some of the decisions you made, despite some bad relationships, despite some bad seasons, despite some seasons of love. It was despite all that that God blessed you anyhow. And you can stand here today not because of how big you are and how great you are, how successful you are, how wonderful you are. No, you are standing here because you've been blessed by God. That's all it is. It ain't, you ain't lucky. You ain't at the right time and the right place. It ain't your connections. It ain't your resume. It ain't your academic credentials. No, you've been blessed. Despite what you think, despite what others say, you've been blessed. 
Have you thought about the neighborhood you came from where nobody, everybody didn't make it out, where some were given up on, but by God's grace, you've been blessed. He blessed you to still be alive. He blessed you to get through school. He blessed you with a good job. He blessed you with support. He blessed you with a praying mama. He blessed you with a future. He blessed you in the company. He blessed you and elevated you. He blessed you with the right mind. He blessed you with gifted hands. He blessed you with a loving spouse. You've been blessed. You've been blessed. Have you looked back over your life and all the things you've been through and you're standing here today because his grace and his mercy has seen you through. Some in this room, you've been sick in your body, but God has healed you. You've had hard times, but God restored you. You've had depression, but God lifted you up. You've been discouraged, but he encouraged you. You wanted to give up, but he blessed you anyhow. You have been blessed. Yes. I said you've been blessed. You're a blessed man. You're a blessed woman. You're a blessed person. You ought to thank God that you've been blessed. Yes, you have. Every day of your life, every time you turn around, the Lord keeps on blessing you. You can't even handle all the blessings he's done. Doesn't even make sense how he's blessed you, how he's covered you. You've been blessed. Hallelujah. 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 I'm a blessed man. You're a blessed woman. And you ought to give him praise as you think about all the blessings he's given to you. He saved you. He forgave you. He redeemed you. He sanctified you. He's going to glorify you. You've been blessed. Yes. Tell your neighbor, I'm blessed. Tell somebody else I'm blessed. Tell one more person I'm blessed. Tell one more person I'm blessed. If you only knew how the Lord has kept me. If you only knew how the Lord has seen me through. 